Okay, so the next speaker is the uh, next lecturer is uh, Alexandre Blas. It's, did I oh. pronounce it correct? I don't know if it's French. Uh, without the S. With Alexandre Blas. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so he's professor at the University of uh, Sherbrooke. Um, he's author of a very interesting review paper. If uh, you didn't read it yet, uh, please plan to do it. It's a cavity quantum electrodynamics. Um, and uh, for the next couple of days, he will talk about qubit measurements and the light matter interaction. Um, I will uh, be here uh, as a, a co-host and to uh, chair the next lecture. So, so if you have a question, raise your hand, uh, write in the chat. Um, and, uh, and, and as, when it's a good moment for Alexander, we will uh, we will hear your question. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, so yeah, thank you for, for the, uh, in fact, the invitation to come and talk at this school, even uh, if it's from my office now. Um, so to everyone on the Zoom call, please uh, interrupt me uh, anytime. Um, so I can cover a lot of material, but that is not the goal of this, uh, of the next few hours. The goal is for you to get something out of this discussion, I hope. Uh, so please interrupt me anytime, really. Um, so Sylvia, you are monitoring the chat. Yes. Right? So if, if there's a question, please just go ahead and interrupt me anytime and, and we can turn this into a discussion. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so there was already, um, let me just make sure that I'm sharing the right thing. So you should see, can you confirm that you see a, um, what, what do you see now, in fact? Yeah, so we see, you see a, a slide. Like, yeah, it's not full screen. I mean, we see the header of your screen, but. Uh, yeah. This is strange. Okay. Let me try something else. Uh, because now I, in front of me, I have iPad. Um, so is that better? Yeah, now it's full screen. Perfect. Okay, so I have two screens and an iPad, so I'm trying to juggle through uh, all of that. Okay. Um, so yeah, thanks to uh, Ian's and the other lecturers for uh, I mean, the great introductions uh, from which I can now simply build upon. So uh, indeed, the goal of this. Okay. So the, can you confirm that you see a laser pointer? Or yeah. some kind of pointer. Yes. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is right. working. Okay, so yeah, indeed. So in the next few hours, I'll be talking about qubit readout and um, light matter interaction in uh, in circuit QED. The goal uh, uh, for this is to well, readout is essential to every experiment, uh, but also uh, the, the objective here is to try to start to understand how we can use these circuits for, for sensing, in particular for uh, axion detection, for example, dark matter detection. So in the next few hours, I'll give the background information that is necessary to understand the searches that are already using uh, these circuits. OK, so let me just, you're all experts now, but let me anyway say a few words about uh, basic ideas of circuit uh, QED, right? So uh, what we have is a transmission line resonator, which I'll draw in this way, which is coupled to some qubit. Uh, 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 the transmon qubit is the most uh, widely used qubit at the moment, but there are many types of qubits, of course, out there. And so we end up as described in great detail how um, you can get strong light matter uh, interaction in this circuit. So again, you have some resonator mode, so some qubit mode, and some uh, coupling. And you already see that I'm taking h bar to be equals to one. So this is the chains coming interaction. So what you already know also is that you can drive this uh, transmon with some voltage uh, pulse to uh, drive some transition, some internal transitions. You can also flux tune this uh, qubit to change its frequency. And in this way, you can, for example, tune the 
the transpond, which was initially at the uh, frequency uh, orange, the color orange, you can tune its frequency now so that such that it's in resonance with the cavity, at which point uh, you get coherent exchange of energy of a photon between a light, the microwave resonator, and matter, the transmon. OK. And what uh, uh, Jens also described is that in the large detuning regime, when the, the color, the frequency of the qubit is very different from that of the transmon. So in this regime of large detuning, then an Hamiltonian, which does a good job, a pretty good job at describing the physics that goes on is this dispersive Hamiltonian. And so in the next few hours, we will look in more details about the consequences of this Hamiltonian. What, 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 uh, what are the interesting features in the context of readout, but also in the context of qubit readout, but also in the context of sensing? Uh, and I will also uh, say, uh, not today, but tomorrow, a few words about uh, light matter interaction in this regime. So more precisely, the outline is the following. So first, uh, um, qubit readout in circuit QD that will keep us busy most of the time. And so I'll ask the question of what is measured in, in, in the qubit readout in circuit QD. And the answer is that we're doing an homodyne or heterodyne detection. And it will be useful to introduce phase space representation to uh, understand this uh, uh, visually. Then I'll uh, jump into dispersive readout, how you can read out the state of the qubit in that dispersive regime. In particular, we'll look at the dynamics in phase space of the state of the cavity associated to the different state of the qubit, and then signal to noise ratio, which is, of course, uh, crucial for a good readout. And then we'll talk a little bit about other approaches, the use of squeezing, something which will become later on important, and uh, um, longitudinal uh, readout. I'll try to say a few words about that. So uh, I've already given a few years back uh, at a summer school a lecture on qubit readout and circuit QD, and it took three hours to cover this, uh, this first topic. So, uh, of course, this was in person, a very different time. Uh, there was lots of questions. Um, uh, let's see how much time it takes uh, this time, but I'd be happy to take as much time as you feel is needed uh, uh, for this section, and in fact, for all sections. So again, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. So once we're done here, uh, I'll talk about signatures of light matter coupling in circuit QD. I'll talk about strong coupling, I'm sure Jens said some things about that, uh, but that will be necessary still to set uh, the stage. And then I'll introduce this strong dispersive coupling regime, which will be useful for quantum sensing. If I have time, and the star, I'll say a few words about ultra strong coupling. And then by the end of the of the very end of the of the lectures, uh, what I'll do is I'll take these different ideas and see how we can engineer interesting quantum sensors, in particular here, uh, quantum sensors for single microwave uh, uh, photons, so single microwave photo, photo detector, detectors, something which, uh, again, is useful for uh, axion or dark photon measurement uh, detection. The main reference uh, will be this uh, uh, review, uh, which was alluded to uh, just before. I'll follow. Uh, the, 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 the notation from that review, but also the, the sections in that review. And then for the last uh, section on single microwave photo detection, uh, this will be a little bit different. This will be based on uh, two papers. So that's a slightly different lecture. It, I'll try not to make this uh, as a specialized talk, but really still uh, give an introductory discussion, but still it will be based on these, uh, on these papers more uh, specifically. Okay, so with that being said, let's move to the first uh, topic, qubit readout and particular homodyne detection and phase space representation. So here I will try something special. <laughs> I will try to move from uh, slides uh, to a writing on the iPad. Um, that's the way that I found to slow me down. Uh, if it doesn't work today, 
I'll move to uh, one approach or the other, the other uh, tomorrow. But for today, let's try that. Okay, so what are we measuring? Uh, um, so this is something which should look roughly familiar uh, to now. Uh, you have here on the right hand side, uh, KVT, which I represent here in this chemetric uh, drawing as, a, as some fabulous ferro cavity made from two mirrors. But this will be your favorite uh, circuit QED KVT, uh, 1D, uh, loved 1D or 3D KVT, whatever you prefer, uh, in which we will place uh, transmon qubits or any other type of qubits or anything that you like to measure. But really, for the next 40 minutes, uh, half hour at least, um, the presence of the qubit is not really necessary. So you can kind of ignore the fact that there's a qubit here and just think very, uh, ba uh, very basic way about um, the, 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 the very general readout process here. Okay, so what do we have? Uh, we have again on the right hand side, uh, what is called and, and hopefully uh, most of it quantum. So at 10 mdK at the base temperature of your dilution fridge, you have a your cavity with a transmon and you are trying to infer the state of the transmon. The way you do that is at room temperature, you send some RF signal down to the cavity and you will simply measure the reflected signal. So this is how a readout occurs in circuit QED. Uh, the first thing to say is that this readout has a really good on-off ratio in the sense that if you do not want any readout uh, to go on, well, you don't send any RF uh, tone at the input. If you want a readout, well, you, you shine some RF tone. Okay, so this is in a sense very different from the earlier approaches to read out to measure uh, superconducting qubits, where uh, devices widgets were were fabricated in proximity to the the qubit, say uh, some squared to measure flux qubits or single electron transistor to measure charge like uh, qubits. Here uh, in circuit QD, we're simply using the natural dispersive interaction between the cavity and the and the, the, the qubit. So nothing dissipative goes on near the qubit. So that's already an advantage. Okay, so the tone is set uh, down. Uh, to attenuate any noise, remove as much noise as possible. Some attenuators are added here and then hopefully your left ear with uh, an attenuated version of your RF signal. And then, as I said, you uh, measure what comes out. And then what comes out is what we have to talk about. Uh, so first, we have to explain what comes out. I've, I've said we measure the transmission, but there's already something to understand about that. And that's the so-called input-output theory. So I won't go into a complete description of input-output theory, but at least I'll give some intuition about uh, how you can understand input-output theory. Then the signal, as we will see, uh, uh, meets what we'll call a circulator, then amplifiers, and then a mixer, more specifically an IQ mixer. And then this will be uh, uh, converted with an ADC, so uh, analog to digital converter. And then you have what is known, as some, in some experiments at least, you have what is known as an FPGA, a field programmable, field programmable, programmable ah, you know what I want to say, gate array, uh, which is essentially a, a small computer which is uh, there to analyze the signal and, for example, take some decisions on some feedback loop you might want to, uh, to, 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 uh, to close here. You might want to send some signal back to the qubit depending on what you've measured. Okay, so what I need to do in the next um, few minutes, as I said, is to talk about these four essential steps of the measurement chain. Understanding what comes out, uh, what is the circulator, uh, what are these amplifiers actually doing, and what is a mixer doing to figure out at the end what is it that we're measuring and how is it related ultimately to the state of the qubit. And I see that there might be a question
Ah, okay. So yeah, yeah, the question uh, is. Yeah, I'm oh, here. Uh, I I can read it out. Uh, we we naturally read it uh, by by all. Oh, I can read it. <laughs> yes. um, um, so which one is more favorable, transmission or reflection? That's a good question. I will not talk about that. Um, you can already very intuitively understand that reflection uh, should be somewhat better because in this setup that I've talked and I'm just showing here, there's some wasted information. So here I'm showing uh, reflection, but there is some wasted uh, information in the sense that there could be signal leaking out of the, let's call this the input port and there's the output port. If there's signal leaking out of the uh, uh, of the input port, well, this is not something that you're measuring. So if you only have a cavity with a single port and or you, you're just measuring reflection, that's already uh, 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 better. Uh, there's also differences between uh, reflection and transmission just in terms of the, the, the phase. It will be easier to explain it a little bit better, but there are some advantages with respect to, to reflection also in terms of the I realized I didn't prepare anything on this, but uh, maybe I can add something on this tomorrow. But there are some advantages uh, associated to measuring and reflection. But this is not something that I was going to cover in, in much details, in fact. So I'm only partially answering the question, but if you want, I can complement. Once I've said a little bit more, I can complement that. OK, thank you for the question. And please, again, don't hesitate. That's exactly what I want. Uh, 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 please interrupt me at any time. Okay, so now that we have uh, described this measurement chain, let's go one after the other. Okay, so this is the first slide where I try uh, something different. So uh, let's look at this input output theory. What I just said is that I have some KVT, right? You send, so you send something in uh, and something comes out. But before uh, trying to understand the input-output relation of this system, let's consider something that you're already familiar with, something which is simpler, and that's a beam splitter. And can you confirm that the writing is relatively smooth? That's, that's OK. I'll take that as a yes or as a no. Yes, it is. Thank you. OK, so beam splitter. So I've got some beam splitter here. And uh, I'll send some signal in. OK, and of course, this signal can be transmitted or reflected. OK. And this beam stator will have some uh, 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 transparency, uh, some some transparency eta. Okay. Uh, so uh, you can ask, what is the input output relation of? Oops. There's no eraser here, so I need to. Uh, what is the I/O relation of this beam splitter? Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, am I missing something in what I drew? If I want to think about the input-output relation. Is there something that I'm miss, crucially missing in this drawing of the beam splitter? Can someone try something? Uh, do I see the participant's name and I can uh, ask questions? Um, uh, I don't know. I'll ask someone that I know. I'm sorry. Cristobal, you want to uh, try to want to uh, take no. a chance? Yeah, we, we can see your. Oh, uh, the speaker, the, 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 they cannot uh, talk. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Okay. But maybe write in the, in the, in the chat. 
Okay. Sorry, maybe no, I missed no, something. That... Sorry, who who is who wanted to talk? I can unmute. Uh, Ah, uh, someone said loss. Okay, I've asked. I tried to point to someone, but I just realized that they are muted by default. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm happy if they're not muted by default if they they want to, but that's fine. Okay, so loss uh, indeed. Uh, that's something that one could take into a, should really take into account. But uh, this is not um, what uh, I, I was thinking about here. Um, what I'm thinking about here is in fact. <laughs> the fact that a beam splitter is not a device uh, which, as suggested by this drawing so far, has three parts. A beam splitter is a four part device. Okay. Yeah, the other part. Uh, thank you. Someone so just said that. So indeed, there's a fourth part. Okay. And even if I'm not sending anything myself to this port, well, there is at least something, and that something is noise, at the minimum vacuum noise. Okay, and as we will see now, this is crucial. So uh, the input-output relation will be written in this way. So I'll call this field CN. I'll try to put the at on top of the operators, but sometimes I'll forget. And that CN can be uh, uh, transmitted. And I'll call this B out. And it can be reflected. I'll call this C out. And now there is a fourth part, uh, 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 which hopefully is only vacuum noise. And I'll call this B in. So this is really a fourth part device, and these creation and animation operators are the creation or the creation and animation operators for the fields at these four ports. And so once we've written this, it's pretty easy to write what is the input output relation. We know that the uh, B out is what is a, a transmission uh, plus in this case reflected noise, OK? We can just intuitively write this. And so uh, what form would it take? Well, there's a transparency. And so there is a, uh, not everything from CN makes it uh, to be out. There is a there is some transparency, as we said. So some is reflected, plus one minus uh, Bn. Okay, that's it. So that's the input output relation for this um, for this beam splitter. Something that if you didn't know already, you knew intuitively. And an important note is that you see that B out. Oops. B out. B out DAG if you work it out, uh, as a commutation relation of one, as it should. It's a bosonic model, OK? And what uh, this statement says is that uh, uh, if you, OK, you need uh, this commutation to be respected, right? It's a bosonic mode. It should be one. But notice that if you add ignore the input noise, that input that uh, this 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 commutator would in fact have been something like eta okay so adding the vacuum noise the noise where you didn't send anything was in fact essential to uh, respect the commutation relations excellent that's fine questions on this OK, so let me continue. So one more yes. in the chat. There, is a, there is a question from Salvatore. Oh, I've this is derived from Fresnel's law. I, uh, well, uh, yes and no. So yes, you can derive them uh, from Fresnel's law. But here, what you're asking is essentially unitarity. If you ask um, uh, uh, 
so if you simply write the um, the the you can write the Hamiltonian for a beam splitter, uh, uh, and from this you you so you have a unitary evolution, and from this you can infer the input output relations, and this is true generally for any any quantum systems. There's a um, there is a, a um, I'll write this here and I'll erase it after, but there is a, a very nice formalism known as SLH, which allows you to derive these uh, input output uh, relations in a very nice way. And the, the three ingredients in this SLH are the three letters. You need some uh, scattering matrix, you need some damping, Limbladians, and you need some Hamiltonian is describing your system. And so, for example, uh, if you have a, a system which has, so we have quantum system one and then quantum, syst quantum system two, uh, if, you, if you give me the scattering matrix, the L and the H associated to all of these objects, we can easily write, even in a complicated network, something like this. Uh, if I shine something here, oops, interesting. Oh, that's unfortunate. Okay, so first, um, first problem, uh, uh, write things in the keynote are not persistent. Okay. Okay, thank you, by the way. I mean, um, sorry, I'm slowly to, trying to go back to- uh, Don't worry about it. I mean, um, it's clear to me that now that it's coming from another formalism, it's totally different from the plane wave approximation in uh, electromagnetic fields, so reflection. Yeah. Okay. So it, the, the story of input-output is quite nice. In fact, it was first derived by Codet and, and Gardiner. Um, so it's worth saying, telling the story, maybe in a minute of that, why this was a, is a crucial part of quantum optics, is that uh, uh, it is known that you can generate uh, squeezing uh, uh, by having a cavity. So that's my poor attempt at writing a cavity with some nonlinear medium inside. inside okay? And uh, people like Jeff Kimball were interested in shining uh, the squeezed radiation, which co should come out of this cavity, on atoms because there were some nice predictions. Uh, that the uh, line width, for example, of the atom would change under uh, squeeze radiation, but that would be different than under vacuum. Uh, but unfortunately, the prediction, the theoretical predictions, you needed quite a bit of squeezing to see something. But unfortunately, the theorists that back in the early 80s, 70s, were computing the degree of squeezing that you could expect in a cavity in this, in this system, if you have a cavity with some nonlinear medium. And they found, in fact, that the maximum amount of squeezing was 3 dB. Uh, you couldn't have more than 3 dB of squeezing. And that was pretty discouraging. These experiments would never work. But so what Cudet and Gardner found was that uh, the squeezing inside the cavity is not the same thing as the squeezing outside of the cavity. And because of this, in, of the interference between vacuum noise at this part of the cavity and the field which is coming out, they found that there was, in fact, um, in the output field, there was no limit uh, to the degree of squeezing. And so that was a reassuring uh, observation. And that's really why it's really for to solve this, this problem of weak squeezing that, were, that input output uh, was derived. It's a very powerful uh, uh, formalism. OK, so good. What did we see? We, see, we saw that um, uh, this is a fourth, fourth device. OK, and uh, let me rewrite uh, what the, the crucial thing that we found. I'll, I don't know why I went out of full screen, and I'll try not to repeat that. Let's see. We found the following. Okay. Now, uh, what I wanted, what I want to do is to that, that that now that this is said, we should do the same input output relation for 
our cavity. So now we have a, a cavity. And for the moment, I will ignore the fact that there's a qubit. The first thing to notice, and this is why I talked about the beam splitter, is that a cavity is, we think of it as a two-part device, right? There is an input port and an output port. Fine. But uh, uh, really, there are, you can really think of this as a fourth part object in the following sense. In the sense that there is an incoming field, and there is transmission and reflection. But there is also, even if you're not shining anything here, there is also input noise at the minimum. OK? So this is, in that sense, again, a uh, uh, this is again a four port device. So C in, uh, C out, B in, B out. And now you understand maybe a little bit better why I decided to write uh, the Bs and the, uh, the, the Cs on one side of the mirrors and the B on the other side of the mirror, because the Cs, I, I wanted to put them on the left side and the Bs on the right side. Great. The main difference uh, between a, the two main differences between a mirror and a cavity is first, uh, we add a transparency eta. And that transparency is replaced by something else here, is replaced by uh, the line width of the cavity or the rate at which. Uh, energy or information, which is stored inside the cavity, is leaked out. And that rate, as I'm sure um, Jens introduced, is called kappa here. And kappa is the photon decay rate, or the line width of the cavity. Very good. Um, OK, so the second major difference is that the mirror here, the, the, the semi-transparent mirror on the left-hand side, is a pretty boring thing. It doesn't have a life of its own. A cavity, on the other hand, has a life of its own. There's an additional mode here, which is the mode of the cavity A. OK. And so this is the essential thing. These are the two essential things that will change the input-output relation. And so now we're ready to write that input-output relation. And again, here I'm not, you can formally derive these relations. Here I'm simply introducing them in what I hope is an intuitive approach. So what is the input-output relation? Well. Oops, I made some mistake here, right? Right, this should be called uh, B out and this should be called B in, right? The, this is coming out and that's coming in. Apologies for that. So what is B out? Well, uh, in the same way that uh, uh, B out here was, was what was transmitted plus what was reflected, well, it's the same thing here. B out will simply be. Okay, that doesn't work. No, um, you lost, um, we lost the screen. Yeah, exactly. So I need to stop uh, working in this way. That's what that means. Okay. Well, I tried. Um, I will finish this slide uh, this way, but then I will stop. Um, but I thought was a good way to, to work. Apologies, everyone, for that. OK. I'm not sure how I, I do that, but okay. So again, mirror, input, output, now cavity, 
width, input, output, output, input, and a mode A. And so what I was going to write is that P out is what is simply what comes out of the cavity, what leaks out of uh, cavity, plus uh, uh, you see there's a BN right here. And so part of that BN will come, the noise or whatever this is, this could be a drive, will come in the cavity, but some of it will be reflected. Okay, there is a prompt reflection here, which could happen. And so plus reflected noise. Okay, so now I can write this more formally. So that means that BN will be what? What is the, what leaks out of the cavity? Well, what leaks out of the cavity is what was in the cavity in the first place. The only thing that can leak out is the photons that you've put there. And the photons that you've put there are characterized. <laughs> okay, uh, so we stop here. I'll share something else. Apologies. Alexandra, actually, um, I mean, in theory, the, the break will be at 10.45. I don't know, do you want to take, just wondering, do you want to take a break now so you can, if you have, if you have to fix something? Um, I think that I'm okay. Okay. Um, because this should work now. Okay. You okay. should see a screen. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. Good, so I had uh, prepared the backup, um, which uh, will now be the number one approach. Uh, so this should not fail now, okay? Okay, apologies. So what did I say? Let me know if the anything should be improved here, if the, the, the fonts are too small, if it should be uh, thicker or whatever, okay. So what is the out? I said is what leaks out of the cavity and what leaks out of the cavity is, is what is what you've put there in the first place. And this is characterized by what? This is characterized by A, the field inside the cavity. So the field inside the cavity it what, is what leaks out. But there is uh, one uh, prefactor here in the same way that unfortunately erased now, there was for the beam splitter, there was a prefactor which was a transparency of the mirror of the mirror. Remember, there was a square root of eta. Now there will be also essentially the transparency of the mirror of the cavity, which is kappa, the photon decay rate, again with a square root. And to that, we should add the uh, the in field. So what do we have? What we have is that the the field which is transmitted from the cavity. Okay, is the combination of two things. It, what's, it is what leaks out and what is reflected. Good. Does that make sense? The second, um, the second, um, the, yeah, I, I will need a, yes, okay, maybe we can, we can take the break now because I need to take some images that were in the presentation and bring them now in this, uh, in this file. And this way I can, I'll be able to smoothly go back. Oh, we don't hear you. You're muted. You're muted now. Oh, sorry. I was I was speaking <laughs> without being on mute. Yeah. So let's take the break now. So Alexander, is fifteen minutes enough for you? Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. So I just need to put two images that were in my mm -hmm. keynote presentation, which I'll stop using now. Okay. So we will resume at ten forty-five. Let's have a perfect. Time. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, everyone. Uh, but we've hopefully uh, ironed out all the problems now. Very good.
<laughs> Thank you. See. Okay, recording. Good. So the 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 the, the prefactor. There's no pre. There's a prefactor in a sense, and it's one, <laughs> and that's just uh, the fact that there's a pure reflection from the from the input to the output mode. Yeah. Okay. So that uh -huh. was kind of my question. So you are saying that there's no noise from this side coming into the resonator. Ah, no, no, no. Okay. Uh, because everything there is, is in fact. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, there is, in fact, that's a good point. And it's a little bit, I understand. Uh, yeah, okay, that's a good point. Uh, uh, it's a little bit misleading here. But in fact, in this input output approach, if you write the um, Langevin equation, the Eisenberg equation of motion for the operator A, you see that you have a contribution from B and so, so that's a very good point. It seems like I'm saying that everything is reflected, but in fact, there is a contribution of the noise to A, to, to, to the dynamics of A. So some is coming in. And that's, in a sense, that's a reflection of, um, of um, dissipation fluctuation, the dis this dissipation fluctuation theorem. If there's dissipation A, there must be fluctuations B and But okay. I understand that my answer cannot be completely satisfactory because I'm not, I'm just writing the answer and sketching an intuition for it. You can go through this and convince yourself that, yeah, okay, it does make sense. And I'll be happy to share some references for that. So we do this, in fact, in the, in the review and uh, the RMP uh, in the appendix. Uh, but the, the version, which was done by Colette and Gardiner in 84, I believe, um, is more straightforward uh, because it makes more approximations. So I'll be happy to share that uh, if you're interested uh, uh, at the end of the, the talk or uh, tomorrow. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, so what did we see? Um, again, now we know that the field which comes out is A. Okay, so the, the, the field which comes out is A plus some noise. So this is great. <laughs> We're already one step further. We know that what we are measuring is the information what, which was inside the cavity. Excellent. We can we can move on, and that in a sense shouldn't be too surprising. Okay, we needed to do that. The second step uh, in this measurement chain is this object, which is called a circulator. A circulator in practice looks like this. This is a big and bulky and lossy object. Okay, this is. Uh, 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 cent a few centimeters by a few centimeters. So this is a non-reciprocal device. And the only reason why this is there, you would really want to get rid of this because this is big, bulky, this is off chip. You would like to get rid of it. But the reason why this is there is because of the following element of the chain, which are the amplifiers. And uh, as some of you uh, will know, these amplifiers are non-equilibrium devices. These are devices which are pumped. There's energy which is constantly sent to these devices, and they radiate noise. In fact, they amplify in one direction, but they also radiate noise backward. And this radiated noise would, uh, in the absence of the circulator, would simply make its way to the to the to the port of the cavity, and would be the noise the noise that would be seen, the BN would not be vacuum noise, but it would instead be uh, 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 noise at the temperature of this amplifier, the effective temperature of this amplifier. And that would simply overwhelm everything quantum going on. Okay, so now we put this circulator. And the circulator, what it does is simple. Uh, it's a three-part device, at least the way we draw it. So remember, there's the amplifiers, which are here, and they are bad. They send noise. But there is signal coming here. And that signal, you, of course, want to send uh, towards the amplifier. OK? And so the circulator is this magical device, which will only allow 
signals to circulate in one direction. So the signal which are coming, the signals which are coming from the KPP are directed to the amplifier. But the signals which are coming from the amplifiers are directed away from the cavity to this third port. This third port, which in practice will be terminated by some 50 ohm resistor. Okay, and that 50 ohm resistor is cold because this is something which is uh, 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 in the cold stage of the fridge. And so now what you have is instead of having non-equilibrium non noise coming from the cavity to, so from the amplifier to the cavity, what you have is the noise which is radiated from this cold 50 ohm back up. But that's unfortunate, there is noise, but that's the best you can do here. This is equivalent to vacuum noise in, uh, in optics. This is the, 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 the best thing you can do is to have the thermal, the, the thermal noise of a cold 50 ohm load, okay? 50 ohm, because if you think it's matched to 50 ohm, of course. So good, the only reason why we have circulators, we would like to get rid of them because they are dissipative, they're lossy, they're big, uh, but we're stuck with them because these amplifiers radiate noise in the wrong direction. There is a lot of work in making on-chip uh, circulators uh, and there is in fact progress towards that, uh, circulators which are made from superconductors. A challenge is that these particular circulators are based on, on magnets. There's essentially some magnets in there and magnets are not compatible with superconductivity. So you need to find uh, uh, ways to, uh, to replace these magnets with something else. And if you're interested, I, I'll be happy to give you an intuition as, as to what we can do to, uh, uh, to make something which is to replace a, a magnet. So to, to, to uh, replace, um, uh, so the, the role of the magnet is to, is to make something which is non-reciprocal here to break time reversal symmetry. And we can find ways to break time reversal symmetry without magnetic fields. If you're interested, I can, uh, tell you about that. But from now, uh, unless there's a question, we will move to the next piece of the measurement chain, which is the amplifier. Again, what we measure of roughly is A, is a field which is, uh, information which is captured in the field is A, and now it meets an amplifier. So what is this? So again, this is an object where a lot uh, could be say, said about. Uh, I believe Annie will uh, talk about that in her lectures. So what I will do here is simply uh, describe the amplifier from the point of view of its input-output relation, uh, just to convince you that what, what is going on here is okay and what we're measuring is really what, we, what we're saying is we're measuring. Okay, so in a nutshell, what are uh, amplifiers where they are objects with gain. You send some signal in and a bigger signal comes out. And the gain will be uh, G. And there's two way to define a, a gain. There is a power gain or an amplitude gain. And there I'll define G as the, uh, the, the gain on the amplitude of the signal, not the, the power of the signal, just there's a square root. Bit, bit. So, okay, so good. So I have some uh, uh, amplifier, which I'll draw in this direction now. So there is some field which comes in here. So let's, uh, let's call this uh, A in, okay? And there's some field which comes out. Let's call this uh, A amp. Uh, and I'd like to write an input output relation for that. And so what I just said is that uh, the amplifier, uh, uh, adds, I mean, there's a gain. And so there's, there's there will be more signal uh, at the end than at the beginning. So you could expect an input output relation, which looks like this. So the signal which comes in is multiplied with some gain factor to give you the output. And because this is an amplitude gain, there's a, there's a square root here. Oh, rather, no, no, sorry. 
I messed up. This is a power game. This is a power game. Sorry, I messed up. Power. That's why there's a square root. Okay. Uh, but can that be true? Um, can that be a career, uh, given what I just said above, thinking particularly about the beam splitter, can that be correct? Uh, can someone um, point a mistake, uh, uh, a problem with, uh, with this? What is missing? And the answer is simple. The answer is the same as for the beam splitter. And so what is it? There should also be vacuum noise. Uh, yeah, case. there should be noise uh, at the minimum vacuum. OK. So um, indeed, the problem, let's read, write it like this. The problem with this relation, if, if that was true, then that uh, would be equal to g, which is, of course, uh, not equal to one unless it's not an amplifier. Uh, an amplifier with a gain of one is not a particularly useful amplifier. OK, so there's a problem. That input-output relation cannot be right because it is uh, 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 not preserving the commutation relation. And so just like we had for the beam splitter, the IO relation uh, 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 needs to account for noise. And so a relation, which makes more sense now, is the following. A amp is still square root of G. Now, I apologize, I will uh, call this B out rather than A. And uh, um, why I'm calling this B out is because you remember this is what is, this is B out, which is coming here. So it's B out, which is meeting the amplifier. So I'll, in this correct relation, I'll use B out. Plus what? Plus noise, okay? And so this bit here is noise. So it's very similar to the beam splitter relation. I've got these square roots and I've got what I wanted to, to, to amplify plus noise. So this is why I showed you the input output relation of, of a beam splitter before, just for this to make a little bit more sense now. Good, I hope it does make sense. So here, there's an extra mode, H, which accounts uh, for noise. Uh, ideally, noise added by the amplifier. I've already said <clears throat> that this is a non-equilibrium device. This is a pump device. These the amplifiers are complicated devices. So there is really an extra mode here. There's an extra noise mode. Uh, uh, there are some internal modes uh, uh, which uh, give you this extra noise. So ideally, you would like to have uh, you would like to have uh, this noise in vacuum. But the fact that it's in vacuum does not mean that it's not adding noise, right? Uh, uh, because of course a uh, you have this, which is now equals to one, even in uh, vacuum. And this is the signature that um, the amp adds uh, vacuum noise. So that's the best you can do, an amplifier. With an input-output relation, which looks like what I wrote, the best that you can do are, um, are uh, amplifiers that add only uh, vacuum noise. And the way we like to say this is that it adds half a photon of noise. But the crucial point is that just like the cavity, just like the beam splitter, just like the circulator, the input output relation of the amplifier is simple. Okay. It does not change in an essential way the signal. You remember, B out is just essentially A plus some noise, okay? 
So this now I can write as essentially some prefactors. So let's call them, I don't know, alpha A plus noise. Okay. So if I use the input output relation, I know that um, this is just related to A. In fact, the prefactor is just square root of G kappa plus some noise, the noise added by the amplifier and the reflected noise. All good. So what we know is that we're, again, what we're measuring is really A. The input output relation is simple. Uh, the, this particular amplifier that I'm thinking about is only one of two categories of amplifiers of so-called quantum limited amplifiers. So the quantum limit here is when you reach, when you saturate this equality, when you, uh, when you reach a zero here, that there's only vacuum noise. There's another type of amplifier. Uh, uh, if the one I'm talking about here is known as phase preserving, uh, there's also amplifiers that are known as phase sensitive. These amplifiers, which will be mentioned later, uh, are in fact uh, squeezers. They, they, they squeeze the electromagnetic field. But for now, let's not talk about this. Excellent. Any questions on this? If not, the last step is the mixer. So the field went out, it went through the circulator, uh, amplified, in fact, amplified twice. Uh, uh, the first amplifier is a quantum limited amplifier, one which adds the minimum amount of noise allowed by quantum mechanics, half a photon of noise. But that signal is still not uh, large enough to be measured. And so typically it's now amplified by high quality, a so-called amp uh, amplifier, an amplifier which adds quite a bit of noise, but that's okay. Once, once it's amplified with a quantum limited amplifier, it's okay to add, uh, it's okay that the second uh, element of the chain not be as, as good. You just want a lot of gain here. And then what you have is the amplified signal, the amp, which meets this circulator. So we need to, to, to talk about that. Uh, a circulator is a nonlinear element. Um, so it's a nonlinear element, which uh, does a simple job. It takes the signal and it multiplies this with some reference signal, which is known as a local oscillator. and spits out uh, the, the mixed signal. Okay, so it takes a signal, multiply, multiplies it with a local oscillator and outputs the result. So more specifically, now thinking in terms of voltages, because uh, remember the, volt, the, the, the bosonic operator is that we've written, uh, the A and the A daggers uh, are related to electric field. A plus A dagger is an electric field and are therefore related to voltage. So you can write the voltage associated to a signal in terms of its creation and animation operators. And so the result, the voltage at the end of a mixer is, I'll just write an equation, what I just said, is first some losses which unfortunately are always there. The voltage associated to this local oscillator, which I'll describe in a second, times the signal. Okay, that's the only role of the, of the mixer. And the, what is a local oscillator? Well, it's a well-defined voltage. This is just something that you know. It's what? It's some voltage, which has some amplitude, some frequency, and some phase. I'm adding a minus sign here just for convenience. So an LO is simply a microwave source, 
with a well-known amplitude, frequency, and phase. In the optical domain, it would be a laser. In the microwave domain, what we're interested in here, again, is just what comes out of your microwave oven or the fancy microwave sources that are used uh, to do these experiments. That's a well-defined amplitude, a well-defined frequency, and a well-defined phase. And so what you can do now is this relatively simple exercise of multiplying these the voltage of the yellow and the voltage associated to the signal, the voltage associated to these A and A dagger that are traveling through the measurement chain. And we follow them again through the mirror of the cavity, through the uh, circulator and through the amplifier. And now we're simply ready to multiply them. And if you do that simple, relatively simple map, you can find, this is written in the review, and it, I won't do the exercise here of rewriting this here, but you can find what is the voltage at the output of a mixer. And you can write this in the same way here that I've written the output of the amplifier in terms of the field inside the cavity, backtracking through all of the measurement chain. You can do the same thing here. You can write the voltage at the end of the mixer uh, 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 in the following way. So there will be a bunch of prefactors. Earlier, the, the only prefactor I had was this alpha, but now there's a bunch of prefactors. And what you have next is the following. What you have is x cosine phi hello plus p sine phi hello plus noise. OK? So this is the output of the measurement chain. This is the output of the mixer. And what are the different quantities here? Well, first, this is all the prefactors that I've packaged together, OK? In the same way, here I've packaged all of the noise together and call this simply noise. And what you have here are two things which should be very familiar. You have the two quadratures of the intra cavity field. You have the two quadratures of the field inside of the of the cavity. Okay. Uh, where they find X and P, the two quadratures, the, the position and momentum, if you want, uh, the, in the following. And there is this factor of two. So everybody has their own convention. I've decided to add this factor of one half there for later convenience. Okay. And so um, please interrupt me if are there are questions. But if you simply follow now the logic of what I said, the, here's the hello, here's the signal. This is what you get. And here I've made one assumption. There's only one assumption that I made was that the frequency of the local oscillator was the frequency of the signal. Okay. And you may wonder, well, I've never really talked about the frequency of the signal so far. And, and in fact, you see now that there is some time dependence that are appearing here. Uh, this is simply taking into account, acknowledging the fact that these, uh, this is an Eisenberg uh, uh, picture, uh, an Eisenberg point of view here. These operators A, are oscillating in the Eisenberg picture at, at their natural frequency, which is here the signal frequency. Okay, so this is simply acknowledging this fact. Uh, and they have two things they have both this natural oscillation plus some um, envelope. The, 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 the amplitude of the field can be modulated, can change in time. So 
these A's have both some natural frequency, which I've essentially taken out here by taking the LO frequency to be the single frequency. And uh, uh, they are their natural evolution. Good. So what uh, have we just learned here? And that's a crucial part. What we've learned is that the voltage that is measured, right? So now we're here at the complete end of the measurement chain. So this voltage will be discretized and then analyzed by some computer or just recorded, right? And so the voltage that is at the end of the measurement chain is expressed in terms of the field inside of the cavity, of the true curvatures of the cavity. Uh, that's a crucial statement here. And that's known as an homodyne detection. And so what we've, not, what we've found is that this type of measurement, which is known as homodyne detection, uh, um, measures uh, quadrature of the cavity field. And that quadrature is which quadrature is measured is decided by some phase. And which, which phase decides which quadrature is measured? Well, that's the phase of the local associated. And so you measure the quadrature that you want and which quadrature you measure is decided by the phase. Okay, excellent. For the experimentalist, you will see that I, uh, um, if some of you are already doing measurements like this in the lab, you will notice that I've decided to put under the rug some of the crucial important uh, aspects, but which to understand the, the big picture were not necessary. The fact that, okay, we are really, uh, the, the frequency of the LO is not exactly the frequency of the signal, uh, uh, the filtering, uh, the fact that we have access uh, sometimes to two quadratures. So I'm putting these aspects under the rug. They are discussed, however, in the review paper. Here, the crucial point that I wanted to make was that by doing, uh, these different steps, uh, amplification followed by mixing, you measure a quadrature of the field. Okay. Is that good for everyone? Nobody's There's no. Good. <laughs> okay. So let me continue then. Um, okay, uh, fine. So we're measuring X, uh, uh, the operator X of the, of the achromatic field along some direction. Uh, fine, uh, but uh, if, um, if uh, you are, you've prepared some state of the cavity field, you may ask, what is the probability of measuring some value uh, x of the field? Say, for example, that you, you choose to measure only the x quadrature here, okay? You, you pick the phase such that uh, cosine is one, so you only measure the x quadrature. What value of, uh, of x are you likely to see in one shot of the measurement? Or on average, what is the probability of finding uh, what is what will be the distribution of the values of x that you will measure in these uh, in these measurements? Well, there's a simple it turns out answer to that. And this is where we can link to phase space representation of the field. And from that point, things can get a little bit after doing a little bit more math. Things can be a little bit uh, we can start doing a little bit less math. Because once we've done this link with phase space representation, we can start to draw phase space pictures and get an intuitive uh, understanding of what goes on. So bear with me as I introduce 
uh, a little bit more map just to uh, make the name to something which is more visually appealing. Okay, so what we know is that the, the probability, which I'll call P of X, I can write the same things for P of P, the probability of measuring some value of the momentum. So the probability P of X of obtaining a value X So I'm trying uh, without much success here to have a difference between two things, right? There is an operator X and there is a value X. So well, there's a big X with an app and there is a small X, which is just some classical number. So the probability of obtaining a value X in a measurement of X is related to some object that some of you may know. So that probability, P of X, is related to, you can always write this in quantum mechanics, right? Where this is the state of the field. Okay, if you know the state, you can always compute it. But it turns out that this quantity in quantum mechanics is related to something that I imagine most of you will have, or many of you will have heard about. It's related to the Wigner function. Okay. So W of rho, W rho is the Wigner function of the state of light rho evaluated at position x and p. And that is integrated over all p. So this is known that quantity, the integral over p of the Wigner function in this way is known as the marginal of the Wigner function. Okay, so this is the probability. What I'm saying here is that the probability of measuring a value x is given by the marginal of the Wigner function. That's a very powerful result. That's a very powerful result because now we can, and, and by the way, I can write this in this way also. Let me just write it. Once I've done it for one, it's symmetrical. So that's all fine. Okay, so that's a powerful result because now we can start to plot things and understand things. In particular, a particularly useful state of light that we will be interested in are coherent states. I don't know if Jens introduced that or not. Okay, can someone tell me? Oh, I don't hear, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I'm also not sure. Uh, I didn't follow all the lectures. I, I think he didn't. He did not, okay. Um, so I, I'm not sure what the background of everyone is here. Uh, don't hesitate to write in the in the, the chat, if you think I should say something about coherent states or not. Alexandra, yes, mentioned that these states, but I believe it's better if you uh, recall all the interesting aspects that are useful for your derivations. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I don't know Good. if the students are, agree with this. Well, better get more details and less. So that's all fine. Okay. So then uh, just a little pause to talk about uh, coherent states. They will be crucial uh, for everything that we will be talking about now. So might as well uh, talk about them. So coherent states are, uh, I've, well, I've already described what a coherent state is implicitly because I've, I've told you that the state of a LO is something which has a well-defined amplitude 
uh, 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 phase and frequency. Well, that's that's a coherent state. This is something that's a state which has uh, a well-defined amplitude and phase, more particularly. And that's a coherent state is the state of your uh, uh, of your microwave uh, oven. Uh, in particular, the fact that there are cold spots in your microwave. Uh, so if you put a, a ring of uh, marshmallows uh, or a line of marshmallows in your in your microwave oven, you'll find some that will burn and some that will not. And these cold spots uh, have, have to do with the, the phase of the of the field, of the phase of the coherent state of the field. Uh, and so they are uh, quantum mechanically. Uh, they are represented in the following way. So first, a coherent state has um, well-defined uh, amplitude and phase. Okay, amplitude, uh, which I will call uh, A, and phase, which I'll call phi. Okay, and so, they are described by the following complex number, a uh, uh, e to the i phi, which we typically call alpha. OK? So that's it. Uh, we can get a little bit more precise by giving their, uh, th th this will become a little bit more Clear once I start drawing phase space representation, Wigner functions, but I'll say a few words and then we'll, we'll uh, write there. Uh, in fact, yeah, okay, let me do this. So they are represented by this, this complex number alpha, which is a to the uh, equal to the um, a times e to the i phi. And obviously, a complex number I can represent uh, in the complex plane, right? So this will be real of alpha, and that will be imaginary of alpha. And so what I'm saying is that a coherent state is a state where the amplitude a is known and the phase phi is known. Okay, so it is represented by a point in uh, the complex plane. However, um, sorry, the phone is ringing. Yeah. However, uh, quantum mechanically, uh, obviously, they cannot be represented by a single point because of the uncertainty principle. Uh, and so they are, in fact, represented by a circle of finite area. So they rather have a finite area. And how can we understand that? Well, um, the way to understand this, I'm trying to follow exactly the notation from the rear view if possible. The way um, uh, to write that is the following. These coherent states are quantum mechanically. We can write them as uh, um, we'll just write a ket on top of them to exemplify that they are quantum states uh, with these two values, amplitude and phase. And we can write their photon number representation. And their photon number representation is the following. So they are composed of photons, and this is how you can write them. Okay, so this is how you can write them uh, um, um, in terms of number, number of photons. And they have a particular property, their, their defining property is in fact that they are the eigenstates of the operator A. So if anything, that's the property to remember. They are the eigenstates of the, uh, uh, of the annihilation operator A. And uh, what does that mean? Uh, 
that means that um, um, if I write, uh, uh, sorry, I should have prepared this a little bit more. I'm I'm thinking in the same way that I'm uh, that I'm uh, doing this. So if I write a, which is e to the i phi, I can write this as real of alpha plus i imaginary of alpha, uh, which I can decide also to call x plus i p. Okay. So this phase space representation, which I drew here, I can write this as x and this as p, because it's the real part of uh, alpha and imaginary part of alpha. And the magic thing is that this, because of this relation, we can see in fact that these x and p that I just wrote are related to the quadratures x and p. Remember that I wrote x as a dagger plus a over two and p as i a dagger minus a over two. And uh, 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 as a result, you see that this, which is essentially a plus its imaginary part divided by two is associated to the real part. And this is therefore associated to the imaginary part. That's exactly why I decided to have this factor of one half here. It's exactly because I wanted to have alpha equals to x plus x, alpha is equal to x plus i p, uh, where x is the, the eigenvalue of the operator x and p is the eigenvalue of the operator p. Okay, there are other representations that you will see in the literature, sometimes often, in fact, with square root of twos here, that will uh, force you to put extra factor of square root of twos here. But with this one half here, what I have is that uh, alpha is x plus ip, where x and p are uh, these quadrature operators that we've already defined, a dagger plus a over two and i a dagger minus a over two. Uh, the other uh, crucial thing that we can say, not that we've said this, is that um, uh, I wanted, why, why I said this is that, so they, you, we can represent them by a point in phase space, but then I started to say like, well, okay, it cannot be a point because uh, uh, it's quantum. We can only describe, uh, it can at most be described by some, some surface because of finite uncertainty. Well, this finite uncertainty now becomes a little bit clearer. And what is the size of that finite uncertainty? Well, it's uh, uh, the uncertainty in X and the uncertainty in P, and that's delta X delta P as given by the uncertainty principle. And the magical thing with coherent states is that they saturate the uh, Eisenberg inequality with delta X equal delta P. Okay, so there was a lot here. I said I didn't say them in the right in the order that I maybe should have. I should have prepared uh, some notes to make sure that I say this in the right order. But let me recap the essential thing. Coherent states are states will well define amplitude and phase. You can write them in terms of photon numbers, right? There are superpositions over all photon numbers, but their real defining feature is the fact that they are the eigenstates of the annihilation operator. And this you can check. Uh, uh, by using this expression here. Okay, good. And so what I know now is that this eigenvalue of the of the of this of this annihilation operator, uh, which already I know is described by uh, amplitude and a phase or a real and imaginary uh, uh, part, I can write this as x plus i p, and these x and p are simply related again because of this relation. They are simply related to the eigenvalue x and p of the position and momentum operator. And then uh, once we have this, we know exactly what will be the size of the coherent state in phase space. Uh, we know what will be the uncertainty in x, it will be delta x, and what it will be in p, it will be delta p. And I can compute this uh, 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 using uh, 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 the relations that I've given above, using these relations. 
And what I find is that the coincides saturate the Eisenberg inequality with delta x equal delta p. Okay. And um, by the way, with the formulation with the the, the with the one half here, uh, uh, what I find is that uh, delta x delta p is one quarter. Okay. With this particular uh, choice of the definition of the quadratures. Okay, good. So what we have is that we can represent uh, coherent states in the XP uh, plane, uh, like so. Uh, in fact, I think that I've already said um, what I was about to say for 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 the Wigner function. Remember why I said to talk about that is what I said is that okay, the probability of measuring some value x is given by the marginal of the Wigner function. So the integral of the Wigner function along, along p and the probability to measure some p is given by the marginal of the Wigner function along x. And uh, um, so I needed to give what I, I needed to say a few words about the, these Wigner functions, what they are, and in, in particular, what they are for coherent states, because these are the states that we're dealing with. These are the states that are used that are produced by the local oscillator in the amplifier, but also are there are the states that are produced by these microwave sources. So what the microwave source really does is to shine a coherent state which propagates through the measurement, through the cavity, then through the measurement chain, it is amplified and mixed. Okay, so these coherent states are the state that we have to think about to deal with. So we already know that their representation in phase space will be given by uh, uh, a blob, essentially. Uh, sometimes these are called the, the lollipop uh, figures. So it's a lollipop somewhere in phase space. But we can also write the Wigner function of such a state. And so if I have a coherent state, which I'll call uh, beta, then the current state, which I can write in this way, is simply a Gaussian. Okay, so the coherent state, not not um, a two D Gaussian. Not surprisingly, uh, given that I just said that delta x equals delta p, that I have something which is uh, a circle in phase space, then formally, if I compute the Wigner function associated to these, uh, to these states, uh, this is what I find, I find a Gaussian. Okay, now I can start uh, plotting this. And so what do I have? Um, So this is again x. This is p or real part alpha, imaginary part alpha. If I have some coherent state which is situated here, so I'm plotting some uh, a circle of uncertainty around the position of the coherent state. Uh, the uh, uh, you can easily ask what will be the probability of measuring P or of measuring X uh, for that particular state. And as I said, uh, the probability will be the marginal of the Wigner function. And so I can plot this here. So this will be the probability of measuring X as a function of X. And what will it be? It will be the marginal. And so what is the marginal? Again, is the integral over P. And so if I plot this here, well, here there is no uh, weight of the Gaussian, there's no weight of the, of the Wigner function. And suddenly here there's some weight. Okay, and so that will be the probability of finding a given value of X in the measurement. And I can do the same thing for P. So 
Well, there you go. So um, this plot tells you what is the probability of finding some value of X or P in one shot of an amodine detection. Good. Um, so that was a little bit longer than I hoped, uh, a little bit more, uh, didn't go in a straight line as I wanted, but I hope this is okay. Because now that I've said all of this, I can go back to I hope was a little bit more intuitive picture and finally talk about the qubit. See how these pictures relate to what is actually being measured once you put a qubit there. Is that okay? Yeah, thanks, Alessandro, for the effort you made to better discuss <laughs> coherent <Yeah. state. laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. We appreciate. <laughs> And, uh, okay. and one more thing is I interrupted you. Sorry, Alexandra. Um, you do have the possibility to save this uh, file you are writing on. Um, it might be useful for students to have it available in our um, in our sure. the folder with the SQMS school. Okay, thank you. Perfect. I'll be happy to do that. Okay. So that uh, uh, that completes uh, part of the. The first part of the so the first part of the lectures were qubit readout and circuit QD. And the first thing that I wanted to say was what is measured. So what we know is we're doing an homogeneous line measurement, homogeneous measurement, which is measuring X and P. And then I really wanted to relate these X and P measurements to plots like this because from now on we will always plot them. Okay, we will always use them. And now you know also exactly if you do such such a measurement, uh, uh, what outcomes uh, can you expect? And these outcomes you can simply draw now as as these Gaussians, as these Gaussians here, uh, 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 which are the marginal of whatever function you're dealing with. Okay, now I'm ready to move on to the second topic, and the second topic is dispersive rebound. Finally. So I started the lecture with one Hamiltonian, which is the dispersive Hamiltonian. And this was described by Jens, who obtained them, for example, with some, um, with some uh, um, uh, Schrieffer-Wolf transformation. And so this dispersive Hamiltonian takes the following form. And that was, in fact, in the question that he asked uh, at the start of this lecture. OK, so this is a dispersive Hamiltonian, where you remember that uh, chi is a dispersive coupling, which will be g squared over delta, where g is the light matter coupling, and delta is the qubit uh, uh, light, the qubit cavity detuning. Here, uh, for all of this discussion, I will assume that a qubit is a two-level system, okay? So that will simply uh, uh, make all of the discussion much, much simpler. But uh, the essence remains the same, although the expression becomes much more, do become much more complicated. The, the, the essence remain, the, the, the key ideas remain the same if you deal with a multi-level atom like a transmon or other qubits, which are have even either uh, more complicated uh, structure. OK, so uh, this is uh, the Hamiltonian that we're dealing with. The first thing to do is to rewrite this Hamiltonian in the following way. So what I will do is write this like this. Okay, and that's the point that Jens was making again right at the beginning of, of his own lecture this morning. So what we see here is that what we have is okay, the cavity with some frequency omega r, the qubit with some frequency omega a for atom. We could have called this uh, different ways, but okay, this is the letter that we chose, plus uh, chi, the dispersive light matter coupling. Once we've packaged these two terms uh, together, what we see is that now it's uh, uh, the, 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 the result, the effect of the dispersive coupling, light matter coupling, is to shift the cavity frequency. Now the, the cavity frequency, which is originally omega r in the absence of a qubit, is omega r plus or minus chi 
depending on the qubit being in its ground or excited state. Okay. And so uh, it is useful to express the Hamiltonian in a frame where everything will be simpler. I imagine nobody talked about rotating frame. Is that correct? Yes, mentioned it. So it was it was mentioned several occasions, right? Okay, excellent, perfect. Uh, please repeat. Okay, it is always good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For learning. I, I'll give the the essence, but I know at least that there's a there's a basic uh, understanding here. Uh, okay, so if I want to talk about rotating frame, uh, it's probably it probably was described uh, for a qubit where it will be a little bit. Uh, uh, simpler to understand, and then I'll move on to the um, to the harmonical theater and uh, rewrite the semitonian in this doubly rotating frame. So rotating frame. Okay, let's uh, just forget the KV for a moment. I simply have a qubit. Okay, and the qubit, the semitonian of my qubit will be uh, I'll call this the atom will be omega a over two sigma z, and of course I can write. Uh, I can uh, plot this in the block sphere, right? I can express this, the state of the qubit in uh, this sphere, which I expect is familiar with everyone. So this is the projection of the qubit on the uh, x, y, and z axis. The y, uh, that's the, 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 if you have some state psi, the projection of, of psi on the z axis uh, is the probability to uh, is the the probability to measure uh, is related to the probability of measuring uh, of the expectation value of z. Same for the the, expect, the projection on y and the projection on x. Okay, and so what uh, you will know already is that in uh, in the block sphere the effect of uh, this term is to generate what is known as the Larmor uh, frequency, the Larmor oscillation. The fact that um, uh, uh, sigma z generate a rotation around the z axis. Okay, and so what happens now is that this state, which is aligned somewhere along the z axis and is sitting somewhere in the x y plane is now rotating at the Larmor frequency, the, at, the, the atom frequency, omega a, uh, in time, okay? And so it is uh, useful that simple evolution is a, a complication in a way because the, the qubit state might be manipulated in different ways. And I'd like to simplify this. And the way that I will simplify this picture is in the same way as in classical mechanics, if I'm dealing with uh, uh, something which is on a, I don't know, something which is on a turntable. Well, maybe uh, most of you have never, uh, uh, I've not used the turntable so much, but uh, something which rotates and I, I, I place uh, uh, some object on the turntable, uh, the, the dynamics will be complicated, but the dynamic, dynamics can be simplified by, in classical mechanics, Placing, uh, the, putting a description in a frame which rotates at the frequency of the turntable. And so I'm doing the same thing here, but quantum mechanically. So what I will do is that I will uh, uh, go to a rotating frame at the, okay, that didn't work so well, at the Larmor frequency. So I will go at a frame which rotate exactly in a way to cancel the, 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 the unitary dynamics generated by the qubit Hamiltonian. And in that frame, well, the state stays put. I'm rotating at the same frequency as the state. And so from that perspective, it looks as if the system doesn't evolve anymore. And so in that Hamiltonian, from that perspective, it looks as if the Hamiltonian of the qubit is simply zero. And I'll put a prime here to remember that this is a new Hamiltonian, an Hamiltonian in the rotating frame. 
And so it's look, it looks as if nothing was happening. There's no evolution. Good. So that's the rotating frame for the qubit. And so I will do that now. I will go to a rotating frame for the qubit where that term will go. But I would also like to do that for the cavity. Okay. I would also like to go to a frame where this term also goes. And I hope that this, uh, uh, the, the intuition that you have for this particular term is that it also generates a rotation. A rotation now not on the block sphere, but in phase space. Uh, and there's different ways to understand this, right? If I just write the Hamiltonian of, of, the, of the cavity as a, uh, or let me use the same letters, omega r as omega r a dagger plus a. If, um, if you don't, uh, uh, if you, there's different ways to give an intuition for why that should uh, lead to a, 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 a rotation in phase space. Okay, and let me try two ways. Um, and you tell me which one you like. First, we know that an Hamiltonian like this comes from an Hamiltonian of the form x squared plus p squared, right? It comes from, I'm removing all prefactors here. It comes from a uh, an harmonic, is, it is an harmonic oscillator. And so I, <laughs> an harmonic oscillator is, for example, a uh, um, just a, a pendulum, a simple pendulum. And what is the movement of a pendulum? Well, of course, it's like this. It's just oscillating. But I can write this movement in phase space, right? I can write this movement in phase space. This is x, this is p. Remember, what I'm plotting here is the movement of this pendulum, which is just generated by this Hamiltonian. And so by plotting is what is generated ultimately by this Hamiltonian now. And so what do I have? I have positions where at the extremum, like here, so at the extremum position, uh, the pendulum doesn't have any velocity. Velocity is zero. And that's true at the other extremum. And then in the middle, position is zero, but it has maximum velocity. And then when it swings back, it has, again, maximum velocity at zero position, uh, uh, but now moving in the other direction. Fine, I, then I can just trace the path in phase space associated with this that I just drew. And that's just something which is rotating in phase space like this. So there's again a rotation in phase space. And that rotation is at the natural oscillation frequency of the system, which is omega r. And I will simply go, just like in the turntable, to a rotating frame where this is eliminated. I will go to a rotating frame now where if I've got some coherent state, which was say sitting here, which before was rotating, now it will simply stay put in that frame. And in that frame, it will look like the Hamiltonian of the system is zero. So I hope that's an intuitive approach. The other way to see this uh, intuitively is that A dagger A, uh, um, um, it's the first time I try this one, so let's see if that works. You know that you will know that uh, 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 p is momentum generates a displacement. If I have a velocity, I'll move. I'll generate a displacement. So p is the generator of displacement. X, uh, uh, which is the conjugate variable, is therefore the generator of of change in momentum. I think there's a term for this in English which I cannot recover now. Is it boost? I don't remember. Uh, so P generates a displacement in X, X generates a displacement in P. And so, uh, fine, let's look at A dagger A. Uh, uh, so <laughs> the conclusion here was that I made this conclusion because P and X are conjugate variable. So A dagger A is also conjugate with something else, roughly speaking, and that's the phase. Here, what is well-defined is the energy, A dagger A. What is not well-defined, however, uh, here is the phase, the conjugate variable. And so that Hamiltonian will preserve energy, but 
uh, will change the phase of the system. And that's exactly what we're seeing in this evolution. It's evolu the, the, the evolution is around some contour of finite energy, finite amplitude, but the phase is winding. The, fi the phase is, is an evolution in the phase. Okay, so there you go. Two ways to see that the Hamiltonian will generate a rotation in phase space. And now what I will do is I will remove these rotations. Okay, a lot of efforts only to say that uh, now I, I can go to a frame where the qubit is still. I can go to a frame where the KVT is still. So this, these two terms are going. And so in that frame, now this is gone. In the rotating frame, the dispersive Hamiltonian, therefore, is simply this. Excellent. So what is, how much time do I have? Until- uh, um, I think you have probably another half hour. Okay, good. So, uh, so maybe, excuse me, Alexander, just want to take the chance because um, I need to leave now for the next half hour and uh, Katerina okay. will, uh, will take that place. Perfect. We can also take this as an opportunity to ask if there's any questions. There was a lot uh, in the last. Uh... So I don't see in the chat, uh, I don't see any questions. Okay. Um, good. So um, now we're ready to talk about qubit relap. Uh, and to do that, I'll start by assuming that the qubit is uh, in some superposition and I'd like to measure uh, the state of the qubit. So psi qubit will be in the superposition ground plus uh, excited. So uh, you will, I'm sure I've seen a notation ground excited and maybe F also the second excited state of the transmon. So here I will use either notation G or E. Again, it's only a two level system for now. So G or E or zero or one, depending on how I want to think about this. Okay, but for now I'll use G or E. And I'll assume uh, that the, so again, this is the state of the qubit that I want to infer, that I want to measure. And I assume that initial state of the cavity is some coherent state alpha. Excellent. So I can now draw in phase space very easily the evolution under the dispersive Hamiltonian. And let me, let me make this a little bit bigger. I can easily write in phase space what goes on now. Because this is x, this is p, I'm taking some coherent state, which is here. Uh, and the question that I'd like to ask is if the qubit, so this is the initial state alpha, if the qubit is in the uh, um, excited state, what uh, will happen to this coherent state? Can someone answer this question in the chat or ask to... Uh... Or ask to uh, gi be given the mic? So, yeah, it will start to rotate again. Exactly. So. Let me do uh, uh, some simple thing here. I've got the dispersive Hamiltonian over here. So the, the answer is correct. So in the rotating frame, the coherent state is, is not moving. In the lab frame, it's rotating at omega r. Now it's staying put there in that frame that we've, that we've used. But now there's two, uh, there's, so if, if uh, you're in the ground state or excited state, now this Hamiltonian 
this what I'm doing here is some semi-classical. It's not quite uh, okay to do this as simply, but that, that's still useful for intuition. If the system, uh, the qubit is in the excited state, this you can think of as plus chi a dagger a. If this, the qubit is in the ground state, the zero state, you can think of this as minus chi a dagger a. And so what you see is that in this frame, there is a data rotation and there is a rotation at a frequency chi, which depends on the state of the qubit. And so now you will have, oops, um, let me put this here. You will have, oh, that's funny. Okay, you will have uh, something like this. You will have a coherent state, which move to some place in phase space. And now another coherence, a different coherent state, which move to a different in phase space, depending on if the uh, qubit was ground or excited. We can now write an equation what that corresponds to. So what we had was that the qubit started in a product state, unentangled state with a cavity. Let me write this here to give me some space for my next drawing. And now under the dispersive Hamiltonian, under some time t, what happened? Well, if the qubit was ground, the qubit stayed ground. There's nothing in this Hamiltonian that changed the qubit state, right? The qubit was started in ground, the qubit and it ends in ground. There's nothing that changes its internal state. But you've rotated, or the cavity has rotated to some state that I'll call phi, uh, 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 which I'll call alpha g. On the other end, if the qubit started in the excited state, the coherent state rotated to a different value. And what are these different values, alpha g and alpha e? Well, it's easy to know what they are. They are, you can, you know them directly. Really, that's the, the power of these phase space representation. You know them exactly what they are by looking at this. You see now that there is a phase and that phase is chi t, okay? And so it's alpha, the original alpha, but the original alpha with a new phase, with a new phase, which is chi t, well, plus or minus, depending on the state of the qubit. So that this is, the exact evolution under this dispersive Hamiltonian. And I would, in fact, encourage you to go ahead and check that this is correct, that check that this is not just some fancy drawing to, to arrive at the answer. I would, in fact, scroll you, sorry for the scrolling, I would encourage you to take a few minutes to start with that representation in phase space, okay? To, to uh, sorry and photon number state, start with that representation and evolve the, evolve exactly this initial state with the qubit in a superposition of ground and excited and the cavity in some initial state alpha and to figure out that indeed this is exactly what you get. Okay, so I would encourage you to do that. Great, so what did we achieve here? What we've achieved is that under the dispersive Hamiltonian, the, there's an evolution of some factorized state, the state which is unentangled, to an entangled qubit cavity state. Okay. And now, if you are able to measure the state of the cavity and reveal that it's in state alpha g. Well, according to quantum mechanics, you will project the system to, uh, to alpha g. And because the state is entangled, you also project the state with g. And that should happen with probability psi g square. Okay. So if you find alpha g, and that you will find with probability 
alpha g, well, you will collapse to this part of the wave function. On the other hand, if you found alpha e, you will collapse here. In other words, what you've done is, what we have now is that the cavity coherent states act as pointer states for the qubit. And that measuring these pointer states reveal is the same as the way it is a qubit measurement. So KVT acts um, as pointer for uh, readout. And this, this notion of pointer states was introduced, uh, or this nomenclature rather than a notion, was introduced by uh, Zurich um, already, uh, probably in the 80s. I'm not exactly sure, 80s, 90s, probably 80s. OK, but now I've said that you can measure alpha e and, uh, sorry, you can measure these, these pointer states. But uh, how do you do this? How do you uh, actually do this measurement? Um, can someone? Um, say something about this? How would you do this measurement now? And the answer is obviously what we've seen before. What is it that you would actually measure given that uh, uh, the discussion that we had in the last hour and a half? What quantity do we actually, actually what does it mean to, to distinguish between alpha G and alpha E? You can write this in the chat. Use the p quadrature uh, probability distribution. Exactly. So, uh, um, if I was better at drawing, you would see that there is no information in the x quadrature. The value of x for alpha g and alpha e are the same, but the value of p are different. And so. Uh, let me try this again. So if, let's try. Pretty good. If you now measure the, 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 if you now measure the P quadrature, well, you will find what? We know what you will find in a P quadrature measurement, right? We know that you will find the, the probability of measuring some value of P will be the marginal of the wave of the, of the Wigner function. And so what do these marginals look like? Well, the marginal associated with the, 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 the excited state looks like that. And the marginal associated to the qubit ground state looks like that, OK? And so if there is a large enough separation here with as little overlap as possible here, then in a single shot, of a p measurement, you will find what? You will find some value. So you'll find this value. Then you can declare that because it's above some threshold that you have, you will have put here. You can declare, OK, that's, uh, that must be uh, e. And if you find a value e, you'll say uh, there, you'll, find, you'll say the same thing. But if you start seeing value there, you'll say, ah, now it's, it's a ground state, OK? So what you need to do is exactly what we said before. You need to measure the output field of the cavity, send it through the circulator, amplify it once, amplify it twice, mix it uh, uh, with, two, with a choice of phase of the ELO uh, uh, such that what you're measuring is the P quadrature. You could be measuring other quadratures. X quadrature would give you nothing, but the optimal one for this particular drawing <laughs> is the p quadrature. And that's the dispersive qubit readout. Any questions on this? This is a, that's a crucial part of, of everything. We've, what we've done so far was to arrive the, I mean, all, all of the previous hour and a half was such that the figure like this would make sense. So I hope it does and please ask any questions if it doesn't. I have a question. Uh, yes. So what exactly is X or better a better way? How do you define the point that this thing is rotating around? 
how do you define x equals zero? Uh, vacuum. Thank you. I should have said that. Yeah, that's a that's a yes. That's an excellent uh, point. I did not say this. So there is one special state, which is both a number state and a coherent state, and that's vacuum. So if you take a uh, vacuum here, which is the state number equals zero, it's the same as coherent state equals zero. They're the same thing. Um, and a coherent state is simply displaced vacuum. You take the vacuum and you displace it somewhere. And now what we're doing is we're doing we're looking at a displaced and rotating coherent state. Does that help? Am I actually answering the question that you wanted to? Yes, I think so, thanks. And let me just say one more word. I was, I keep, initially I was talking about vacuum noise. Oh, we only want to add vacuum noise. Well, now you see this vacuum noise in this, uh, in this picture, right? The vacuum noise is this, delta x, uh, delta p, which I said in the, in the, um, in the 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 uh, with the the choice of uh, definition of the quadrature that I have was uh, one half, and so this size of this blob around vacuum is quantum noise or vacuum noise, and in this particular picture here, I've only assumed that there was vacuum noise, right? The blobs here, uh, uh, the blobs here when I said, oh, you, this is the blobs that you have inside the cavity, and now this is the probability that you'll measure something, <clears throat> you have to remember that there's a lot going on here. So this is inside the cavity, right? That's the life of the cavity inside. And then here, what I'm trying to do in this plot on the right-hand side, just to tell you that there's more complexity lurking underneath, is that this is, I'm trying to infer what will be the probability of measuring some value of x at the end of the measurement chain. But of course, the measurement chain as itself, that's sorry for the scrolling, that's the problem of having a blackboard, uh, as itself going back to this expression, as itself added noise, right? Amplified noise, uh, the, the, the circulator, the mixer itself is imperfect. And so there's in fact more noise and these distributions in practice will be wider, will be more difficult to, to tell apart. Okay, and we will need to work to optimize uh, how far these two distributions are. These, these two distributions are such that uh, we truly can resolve in a single shot, in a single measurement, uh, E from G. Good. Um, I think I only have a few minutes left. Maybe I can, with a few minutes left, um, like 10 minutes, is that correct? Yes, you do have um, actually up to 19.20 here. I mean, oh, perfect. a bit of okay. 15 minutes just to also have time for questions. Okay. So you have uh, time, Alexander. Perfect. So what I will do now is to, um, um, give a little bit more information about, should I do this? Choice. Let me do it. I will give you a little bit more information uh, uh, about the, uh, the, the, the evolution of the state because later I'd like to talk about different types of measurements and it will be important to, to have this in mind. Okay, so, so I hope this, I hope that I'll be able to uh, uh, used information that I give you now a little bit later. Uh, at least that's that's why I'm. Uh, I'll, I'll say these few words now. So here, what I've said that we started with some cavity state, which was in some coherent state alpha. But uh, that's not how it works. A readout starts, as we just explained here, with a, a cavity which is empty. The cavity is empty. You do your quantum information, whatever. You, you prepare your interesting states of the qubit, E plus G, whatever superposition. And then you 
start to read out the cavity. So the cavity is in the vacuum state. You send the RF tone. You look at uh, transmission, collect the, the transmission. And so the, in this process, the cavity, in fact, starts in vacuum. And at the end of the measurement, goes back to vacuum. So I need to say, to, to, to explain this in a little bit more detail. Uh, and so, uh, so, so it was tied by, but the cavity starts in vacuum. Not alpha. And so now what we need to do is to add the fact that we're driving the, the cavity. Okay. And now I will really know if uh, with Jens and Ali, we sat down and we decided who would talk about what and in what order. And uh, one decision that we made was to help me say the next, to write down the next equation. So if we did our job right, you should be familiar with the next equation. Uh, uh, tell me if you're not. So now what I need to do is to add the fact that there is a drive on the cavity. The fact that, okay, I've got this, cavity with, uh, again, uh, uh, this, this qubit. And now I will be driving this and collecting what comes out. And so the drive needs to be added to the description. OK. And so what is the Hamiltonian now? Uh, with dispersive plus drive. Now, uh, uh, again, in the, not in the rotating frame, in the lab frame. Oops. Okay. Right, so this is the dispersive Hamiltonian. Now the question is, what is the Hamiltonian, which corresponds to this wiggly orange line, which comes in the cavity. What is the Hamiltonian of a drive on a cavity? And you should have already seen what is the Hamiltonian of a drive on a transmon qubit, correct? And on a transmon qubit, it was written in terms of B rather than A, but it had the following form. It will be the same form here because after all, uh, KVT is a limit of a transmon where the anomalicity goes to zero. And so that aspect will be exactly the same. And so hopefully this was said, but let me just write the Hamiltonian. And so what you have first is some amplitude. Epsilon is the amplitude of the drive, which can be modulated. And then you have some drive at frequency T, which looks like this. And please uh, confirm that you have seen this. So this is the effect of a simply a voltage drive on a cavity. And if you've not seen it, I think I can justify it. I can give an intuition for why that should be correct. And the, the intuition is uh, if you've agreed that uh, <clears throat> If you agree that your microwave, or if you believe me that your microwave oven uh, uh, prepares coherent states of the microwave cavity where you put your food, and that these the microwave sources that are used in ex these experiments also uh, uh, spit out coherent states, they have well-defined amplitude, phase, and frequency, then this drive should prepare a coherent state of the cavity. And so this term that I've added should obviously prepare a coherent state of the cavity. And we can check that we can, uh, so that will be our justification for why this term looks like this. And I hope that you will, uh, you will believe me. And so the way to do this will be again, to go to a rotating frame, but uh, here I'll go to a different rotating frame. Before I wanted to cancel this term and that term, okay? This is not the rotating frame that I will choose now. I will go to a different rotating frame where what I will do is rotate at the drive frequency. And so that will eliminate these annoying exponentials for the drive. And so if you follow the math, so you go to a rotating frame 
for the oscillator at the drive frequency, what you find is the following. Stop me if I need to go into more details here. Oh, um, just for fun. I've changed the phase of the drive. I've done nothing but change the phase of the drive. I've added phases here. Okay, so this is what I get. What does this generate? We agree that this was a rotation. Okay, that was a rotation. And so in phase space, what I had was if I started somewhere, I'll have a rotation which looks like this. Okay, what does this new term generate? Do you agree that you can write this as two epsilon p? Okay, p is a dagger minus a times i divided by two. So what does this term generate? Can someone write it in the, I've already said it, but can, you, can someone write it? Uh, nothing so far, someone wants to take a chance. The keyword is generate here. You remember that I said that um, if you have a momentum, classically, you have a momentum, you have a speed, you have, you have a velocity, you will, they will, you, that will generate a displacement. So P is the generation, uh, is the generator of displacement along, um, along um, um, position. Okay, thanks. And so, P, which is the conjugate variable, therefore uh, generates a displacement along X, okay? And so the role of this Hamiltonian is to generate a displacement along X. Okay, so you start in the vacuum state and you displace the vacuum. And we said just a minute ago that a coherent state is the displaced vacuum. And so the role of this is to displace along x. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Please ask a question if you doesn't make sense. You can, uh, um, yeah, okay. So this is what this is what we have, and so now the real dynamics is the combination of these two things. Okay, you start in the vacuum state. Not too big, otherwise, and then before there can be any rotation, right? In the absence of displacement, you have a rotation around vacuum. That's nothing, there's no rotation. However, now what you have is a displacement. And with that displacement, now it is associated a rotation. Okay, that should be all symmetric and nice, but that's the best I can do. And so what you have is, um, what we had before. Okay, so what you have is as before, uh, the two blobs. Now, with the difference that uh, we have the full dynamics. We don't have simply oh, there, there was a displacement. Now there is a there is a rotation. Now we have the two things together. 
And why am I saying this? Because uh, look at the early times, okay? Time is flowing like this, this is zero, and that's final time. Look at the initial times and notice that there is, the readout doesn't provide any information. The evolution is such that it provides no information at early times. At early times, what you have is blob, which is the two blob, red and blue, are cannot be distinguished. They are just moving, they're just, just being displaced. And then suddenly rotation kicks in. And so at early times, there is no information in the dispersive readout. And that's one of the difficulty in optimizing this readout. We want a readout which is faithful. We want to know that if I started in red, I find red. If I started in blue, I find blue. But I also want, and I want that with a very high fidelity, something like if you want to do quantum error correction, you know, that fidelity should be uh, above 99.9% in a single shot. But you also want this to be fast. You want the evolution, the, the readout to be extremely fast, uh, hopefully below a few, or below 100 nanoseconds, a few tens of nanoseconds. And that's a difficulty because now uh, at short times, because uh, you have a, a combination of a displacement and a rotation, there's no information. Okay, so we will have to work our way around that, or at least improve things, optimize things, such as to still have very short and high fidelity readouts. So I think I can just wrap up here by giving uh, the the basic highlights of what we've seen. Right. I think uh, I think that if I have time for that. So what we've seen is uh, uh, so dispersive qubit readout first starts by homodyne detection. So you measure the quadratures x and p of the electromagnetic field inside the cavity, and this is the power of this input output relations that we we, we, drew, we wrote initially, is that now the field which has leaked out of the cavity, you can go back and say like, okay, that it's related in that way, very precisely way to the field which is inside the cavity in the first place and therefore to the qubit. Okay, so you can measure X and P of the intra-cavity field with this homodyne detection. Uh, so again, we use the dispersive interaction, which is this, which generates plus drive, which is this basement plus rotation. A crucial aspect of this uh, um, readout is, I've already mentioned this, but now I want to be more precise, is that it is Q and D, quantum non demolition. The, the short way of saying is that H dispersive commutes with sigma Z. The, in other words, the operator that you want to measure, sigma Z, commutes with the Hamiltonian generating the dynamics of the measurement. And so the, 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 which that implies that sigma z is not, is a concept of motion. Sigma z is not changing. And so the action of measuring the qubit doesn't change the state of the qubit. Apart from the essential dephasing, the state will collapse. Of course, it will collapse to ground or excited but it'll collapse with the right probability. If you started in psi ground uh, plus psi excited, it will collapse to ground with probability psi ground and to excited with probability psi excited. If uh, a reader of like introductory, introductory textbooks on quantum mechanics will look at this and say, obviously this is what a readout does. A readout projects according to the probabilities in the wave, initial wave function. That's an ideal, that's an idealization of a quantum measurement. 
In practice, there are many types of quantum measurements which are not quantum denotation. They change the state that is the, the, the state of the system that is observed. And a good example of that is a photodetector. A photodetector destroys the photon to, 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 to detect it. It's after there, before there was a photon, after there is no photon. So it's clearly not a quantum non demolition measurement of the number operator. It changes the number operator during the readout. And so uh, our goal here is to go as close as possible to the idealized uh, measurement of uh, textbook measurement. So in the next uh, lectures, I'll uh, give a little bit more insights about what are the problems, where does it fail in fact, um, uh, what is difficult in making this readout as good as possible, and then move on to light matter interaction. Okay, Alexandra, thanks for the lesson. You're right in saying that if you write down things, uh, it's uh, the speed uh, uh, is more proper for, for who's listening. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, there is, there are, we have, do have a few minutes for questions. I remember the students that are, uh, let me say at uh, Fermilab time, 12.45, we will have uh, um, a guided visit by Daniel Frolov, uh, Fermilab facilities. And uh, um, this translates to 1945 uh, INF and time, I say. Uh, so please, uh, if there are questions, it's now uh, the proper time to ask. We have a couple of minutes. Um, yes, I have a question, uh, if I may. Perfect. Uh, so first of all, thank you for your uh, Nice lecture. Um, so one thing maybe was an observation. I think there's a typo in uh, looking at how um, the cavity and, and qubit state evolves um, after time t. I think there's an, a factor of i missing in the... Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, I did the calculation and yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a, it has to be imaginary. It's a phase. Thank you. And one thing I didn't quite understand is how um, the rotating frame is, in, is used in the final section where we describe the dispersive plus drive uh, Hamiltonian. Um, yes, it, it, here it was not, so I've, I, my, I already convinced you, I hope, uh, that the, 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 the role of this um, uh, dispersive interaction was to generate a qubit state dependent rotation. This is why initially I went to the rotating frame. I did that because otherwise we would have some rotation and on top of that, some rotation in different direction it gets difficult to look at. Here, it was not strictly speaking necessary to go to a rotating frame, in fact. Uh, I did that simply because if you want to show just mathematically that this leads to a, a coherent state from starting from time t equals zero, that's a bit of a messy calculation because of the time dependence. But in that frame where there is no time dependence, the calculation is, is immediate. Essentially, you exponentiate this and you find that you'll have a, It's just, yeah, it was not really necessary. It was just that the calculation there, if someone wants to do it, is easier. OK, thank you. And I'm. Um, Curious to hear, Nate, so there was a comment. Thank you for, about the, the way I do the notes now. So uh, the, the beginning was a failure of, of, uh, of Keynote. If you find that my writing is OK, if the speed is OK, please uh, don't hesitate to let me know. You can email me about this. I'll be happy to uh, adapt uh, for, the, for the rest, uh, the rest of, the, of the lectures. Hey, I have another question. Uh... And uh, by the way, I think the speed is fine by me. Um, Perfect. So uh, this- I'll take this as my only data, data point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, the vacuum state, this is a state with zero photons in the, in the resonator, right? Or in the cavity? Yeah. How do you prepare yes. that? Ah, yes. You, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, this is done uh, in, Circuit QED by going to deletion fridge uh, temperatures. Sorry for the scrolling, but you see here what I had was a, a 
15 or 10 millikelvin cavity. And so if you compute the, the, the Bose-Einstein factor at, for, uh, I don't know, 10 gigahertz cavity at 15 millikelvin, you'll find that it's very close to vacuum. And so vacuum is reached by waiting, essentially. Uh -huh. So you're saying that the, the ground state of the cavity is zero photons, which makes yeah. sense. And then you cool it down to, to the ground state. OK. Yes. So makes this sense. is why we cannot work to, uh, with, with resonators and qubits, which are too low in frequency. Otherwise, they would be thermally populated. <laughs>